Amen. Please be seated. So today, the uh, last uh, Sunday before Advent is Christ the King Sunday. Christ the King Sunday. The Feast of Christ the King. Uh, the concept of, or the uh, sort of the symbol of Christ as King is ancient, it's biblical, it, it goes back to the early church, but the celebration of a Sunday or any day marking Christ as King is relatively recent. Uh, it goes back to 1925, when, the, at least in the Roman Catholic Church, Pope uh, Pius XI decided to institute this feast day and decided to do it for multiple religious and political reasons. But I think one of his reasons for instituting this feast we can probably get behind uh, today. His reason was that you all know what was going on in Europe in 1925, the rise of totalitarian and nationalist movements, and he wanted to remind, in this case, a particularly uh, Christian continent, who their real loyalty uh, should be with, not with these totalitarian movements that were um, demanding the ultimate and complete loyalty of, their, of the citizens, but with Christ the King. Now, why do we celebrate a holiday that was established by the Roman Catholic Church in 1925 in an Episcopal church? That's another question. Well, uh, I'd sympathize with you if you think it's because Episcopalians are Catholic light and we just follow everything the Roman Catholics do, but it's not true, actually. Many other Protestant denominations celebrate this day, uh, and it goes back to that post-war optimism, the ecumenical movement. Vatican II was happening. People were, different denominations were starting to reach out to each other. We were hoping that after the horror of the 20th century, maybe we could be united again. And if not united, at least we could start sharing each other's lectionaries and sharing each other's holidays. And to share this day had particular significance because if we're trying to be united, at least as Christians, we can find common ground in our loyalty to Christ as King and Christ as our common foundation to build a more peaceful world. I'm sorry to say, but all those admirable hopes looking at the world today have clearly been well, dashed, it seems to me. Uh, Pope Pius's admirable uh, intentions of creating a day that would remind us that our loyalty is to God, ultimately, and not to the state or to, to these powerful nationalistic movements. Uh, and we all saw what they did in the 20th century. It's all rising up again here in our own 21st century in this country and all over the world. Now, I've never seen it so bad. I always, I always knew things were difficult. I knew growing up about racism and I experienced, I remember particularly after 9-11 and, and, um, and the invasion of Iraq, the, the vicious hatred of Muslims in this country. But let's put it this way, I would have never imagined seeing uh, when they were storming the capital, at least one person wearing a shirt celebrating the murder of six million Jews. Truly, we have not learned our lessons from the brutal 20th century. Now, it's not just in this country. These movements and these, these autocrats are rising the world over. I'm in a class at Yale, a fascinating class about the history of the city of Istanbul. The class is called Constantinople slash Istanbul, because you know it's Istanbul now, not Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. A long time ago it was Constantinople, but now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. Good, you all know the song. I'm just making that joke now because I know that if I don't make that joke, you're all going to come up to me after the service and make that joke. So let's get it out of the way. Uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, uh, we're studying the entire history of the city and its urban landscape and how it has changed and how that has marked the people who have passed through it and lived there, the multi-cultures who have been there, many cultures, and the conquerors who have come through, the leaders who have built and destroyed and rebuilt monuments and mosques and churches. And we got to uh, what's going on now with Erdogan in Turkey, a uh, right-wing leader who is destroying the little democracy they had in the Turkish Republic, sadly. And one of his actions last year, you may have heard of it, was changing the Hagia Sophia, beautiful museum, uh, formerly Byzantine church and then Ottoman mosque, into a mosque again. Um, there are plenty of mosques in Istanbul. Uh, his action 
sort of the equivalent of Trump holding the Bible in front of St. John's Church. It was using religion to make a political point and to shore up uh, one, his party and one particular branch of Sunni Islam. Uh, now, I was reading into this class reactions to destruction of, uh, or not destruction, the, um, the conversion of Hagia Sophia uh, by Erdogan into a mosque, and one of them touched me profoundly because it was given by a, a parliamentarian in Turkey named Garo Paylan, who is uh, an Armenian Turk in the Turkish parliament. Let that sink in. Uh, I think there's only two. Now, this is, I suppose, like uh, an indigenous person in our own Congress. This is a person whose people they tried to completely eradicate, and here he is serving in the Turkish parliament. So the words coming from him, from him particularly move me. He said of the conversion of Hagia Sophia, you have to understand some context, Hagia Sophia is a domed church, right? Beautiful dome. Hagia Sophia, the dome of Hagia Sophia was large enough to include us all. Evidently, now it's not. Now, it doesn't represent the many rich and varied cultures that have passed through that magnificent city of Istanbul. And I thought about that quote, and I thought, you know, thinking Christ the King Sunday, and, and thinking about creation a lot now, the dome of the sky, God's firmament also, is big enough to include all of us. And yet that's a lesson we seem never to get. To this day, we still have Autocrats going to war, genocides, corporations devastating the earth, displacing thousands of people for their own personal gain, and acting as if there wasn't enough room for each and every person under the dome of God's sky. And yet, that's how they act, that's how it is. So, that's where we're at now. What does it mean, in that case, if we don't have kings anymore, or not many kings anymore, to say that Christ is a king. Well, I think the spirit of human kingship, at least in the sense of grasping for power and taking power and acting as if there wasn't enough room for everybody here, uh, is still alive and well today. If that's the case, what sort of king is Christ? And what are we celebrating on Christ the King Sunday? I don't have an easy answer. I, I could write a book about that, I suppose, but I'll try and take a stab at it looking at our gospel passage today. Um, we have this further example in the gospel of Christ winning a verbal sparring match with his opponent. But I think it's a little too romantic to see it that way. You have to remember that in our gospel, Christ is brought before Pilate after a long night when he has been arrested, shuffled away, handed over from authority to authority. In the Gospel of John, each time he's handed over, it describes how he's bound. Uh, in this Gospel, he's been slapped by the temple authorities. In the other Gospel, he's been explicitly beaten and mocked by the temple authorities. Prophesy who hit you. Um, and he's been relentlessly interrogated over and over again. And now, his own people who have been interrogating him bring him to this pagan, this Roman leader, Pilate. And what does Pilate do? After he's already been beaten and bound and questioned time and time again and up all night, Pilate takes him inside the praetorium, yes, but he doesn't give him any rest. He continues interrogating him. It's not a stretch to say that Jesus' passion has begun already at this point. I see him bowed down, I see him bleeding, at least bruised. Jesus um, is already suffering. Perhaps that's why his responses to Pilate here, though uh, masterful and, and quite to the point, are a little less wordy than the rest of Jesus' speeches in the Gospel of John. He gets, gets right to it here. My kingdom is not of this world. I picture these responses, you know, not as some philosopher debating with, uh, with, with, with Pilate, but a, a, as a sigh, almost as he's saying, get away from me. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. You say that I am a king. For this I was born. I came to the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. I hear in that, just leave me alone. My kingdom is not of this world. I am not like you and your power. Now we do have two kings here, I suppose. 
Pilate is a representative of Caesar, so he is a vice viceroy, the, the representative of the king in Judea. And Jesus is also a king, a different type of king. Uh, in, in Jewish thought, in Jewish theology, I wouldn't say it's anti-monarchical necessarily, have kings, of course, but when you are praying so often to God, Lord of the universe, and acknowledging that there is a higher power, as we saw in, um, in our Samuel reading today, uh, uh, where, where it's, it's, it's the God of Israel who is above the king and who the king answers to, you're going to have uh, a little bit of skepticism towards human rule and human power. You have, you're going to put a little bit of limit onto it. And yet, this king of the universe, who made the dome of the sky and established the foundations of the earth, we see before human power completely bowed low, completely humiliated. Now, we're going to celebrate as we go into Advent and await another sort of the humility of our God as we expect the arrival of God in the humble form of a child born of Mary. But in this case, we see the humiliation of our God before human power, and he wins. Even though he's physically destroyed, he wins. Because God, who created life from the dry, dusty ground, becomes dust himself. And that is what we're seeing here. And that dry dust is fruitful again, because he establishes his foundation in a man, in Jesus. Now, Caesar is going to build and destroy and establish foundations and tear them down. The temple would be destroyed by Caesar not long after. The Hagia Sophia, that beautiful church I was talking about in Istanbul, was uh, important to remember that it was built by Justinian, another emperor, after, uh, after putting down a rebellion that ended in the death of 30,000 people that he massacred. And now Erdogan in Turkey, just this year, built a tawdry replica of a beautiful Ottoman mosque in the middle of Taksim Square, a plaza in the center of, uh, on the European side of the Bosphorus, where in 2013 he put down a massive protest for democracy and human rights, ending in the death of 11 people. Now, it would be easy with all this for me to say, it's not the building, it's the people, right? We don't need buildings. But I don't think it's that simple. Buildings tell multiple and varied stories because they're only, they only have so much energy and charge as we give them. So it is not the building, but it's the people. But we live in relationship with our buildings and with our spaces, and they create us as we create them. Now, uh, that beautiful Hagia Sophia, for example, yes, it has a sad beginning as a way to shore up Justinian's power after a massacre, but also remember, its architect took care to make the floors marble because it was believed at the time that marble was congealed liquid. And then he made the lights coming from the dome play off the marble so that it looked like the spirit hovering over the waters at creation, and that this, um, that, that, that this was representative of Saint Wisdom herself, the spirit of God that created all things and was hovering over the waters. This was hope for a new beginning. And of course, uh, that space has been charged with the devotion of thousands of people of different faiths and of no faiths coming into it as a museum for, for hundreds of years. I think about our spaces here too. Now, I'm sure the stones of this building have many stories to tell, and many of you uh, over these weeks are going to be sharing these stories as we testify each Sunday, each one of us, uh, to our coming to this church and to, its, um, and to what it has done for us. And God willing, soon, that parish hall is going to be converted into apartments, affordable apartments, so that we can uh, so that we can afford, offer something good for this city and something good for the urban landscape and so that we can afford to keep this building going for future generations to add their stories to these stones. Our buildings, our foundations can be built by conquerors, they can be founded in blood, or they can be founded in hope, and sometimes they're founded in a little bit of both. 
Our city landscapes change, monuments are built, monuments are torn down for better or for worse. But let's remember, under all this, our foundation is not brick and mortar. Our foundation is the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. His temple is his body, and his throne is the dome of the sky, the earth his footstool, and on earth he's seen in the feet and in the faces of each and every one of us. The tyrants who conquer and build up buildings and tear them down are wrong. Under the dome of God's sky, there is room enough for all of us. Amen.